If this is your first time on the channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button and notification bell. That way you know when I upload my videos to YouTube. Welcome to NGN, Nerd Guy News, where all nerds collide. What's up, everybody? Nerd Logic here. Man, I'm late to the party, but we have got to talk about this episode finale of The Mandalorian. Man, um, so the first scene is with Bo and the rest of her Mandalorians uh, following through the base on Mandalore that Moff Gillian has basically established. And it picks up straight off with action. And we see Bo and the rest of the Mandalorians making their way through a whole bunch of corridors to the base. And they are basically almost outnumbered at this point so she has to get axe wolves to uh get the reinforcements so we see him heading up to the light cruiser which was moth gideon's but they won that from him in season two and when he gets up to the light cruiser uh he is basically telling Bo that uh, he's losing frequency. She's basically giving him commands and orders to send in the reinforcements ASAP because Moff Gideon is alive. He has made this base on Mandalore and there is really nothing they can do at this point except for stopping Moff Gideon and the super elite commandos on foot because if those TIE interceptors get in the air, their whole entire fleet will be done for. So uh, Axe Wolves is in space and once he gets up there, uh, he's basically telling Bo that he is losing his communications, but he has his orders and he will send reinforcements as soon as possible. I also love this scene because we get a real cool scene where Bo and Kashka are working together to take out a couple of elite commandos and they get blown to smithereens. So we see Din Djarin in the next scene and he is being carried down the hall by Moff Gideon's super elite commandos and then is waking up out of his consciousness and he decides to uh, basically get himself out of the trap that he fell into and the cool part is is that we see Din take down these super commandos and he's fighting them he's really giving them a run for their money considering that his hands are tied and his feet are tied they're blasting they're shooting him and he's really having a hard time uh, trying to defeat these these super elite commandos. They even use his flamethrowers on him uh, just because of how tactical he was even while being captured. But he managed to get loose and with the help of his fouling with Grogu, uh, Grogu using uh, IG-11's body, he was able to free Din and spray him with back to spray to heal him just in case. And Din was basically telling him that he didn't need it, that he was just fine. So he helps Din up and they discuss about um, how Grogu needs to be brave and that Moff Gideon cannot escape. And he asks Grogu, will he be able to help him? Will Grogu be brave enough to work with Din and find Moff Gideon and put a stop to this? And it's the only way that the Mandalorians will be free. It's the only way that Mandalore will be free. So Din and Grogu work together, and as soon as Grogu agrees, that's when the rolling credits starts. And this episode is called The Return. So we cut to a scene where Bo and the rest of the Mandos are back on Mandalore. And she's communicating with Din because Din says that he has found Grogu and that they are safe and that they are going to pursue uh, Moff Gideon. But Bo is telling Din that he's pretty much on his own and that they are going to go search for uh, refuge somewhere else, at least until backup comes. So all the Mandos leave um, the base and they fly off. And when they fly off, you see the TIE interceptors. They're getting ready to take off to go into space to basically take down the light cruiser and the rest of the mandos are pretty much on their way down uh until we see moff gideon he's in his 
his headquarters, his base, and a super elite commando comes up to him and tells him that Din and Grogu are on their way to the main office or the main center of the, of the stronghold. And Moff Gideon is basically looking at them on the, his schematic hologram of his base and he's tracking Grogu. He basically tells the uh, super elite commando that he'll handle it himself and he goes off to prepare to face Grogu and Din. And we cut to a scene where the super elite commandos are guarding the hallways and the corridors. Din and Grogu are walking around trying to make sure that they can get by but they need R5 to help them get through the entire base. So Din is communicating with R5, asking R5 to go into the base and sneak in and get the schematic so he can open up all the doors in the base and kind of give Din a heads up, which I actually love this scene because we see R5 do some espionage, like spy 007 type of thing. It's pretty cool to see R5 um actually creep around corners and try to wendle his way around the tire base i thought it was kind of hilarious and it was fun at the same time but it was kind of cool to see and you see him actually using his tools just like r2d2 does in the original movies and he's basically hacking himself into the system and uh trying to get grogu and din the schematics of the entire base and when he does it pops up on uh, Din's comlink and it shows him a complete hologram of where Gideon is. These two are trying to find a way to get into Gideon's stronghold, the center of his office, and find a way to trap him in and kill him. So these next couple of shots are probably like one of my favorite shots in the whole entire episode, but we see Axe heading up to the light cruiser to go get the rest of the Mandalorians because Bo asked him to recruit everyone else to come down and help out with backup support. And you clearly see Axe, he gets up there. He is uh, communicating with, I can't remember exactly who is the young gentleman that is like second in command to Axe Wolves, but he's communicating with him and he's letting everyone know like Lady Bo needs everyone on Mandalore now. And Axe just comes in like a complete badass. He takes over the ship. He tells everyone that they need to get to um, to the other gauntlets and get in there because these TIE interceptors are getting ready to basically wipe out the whole entire fleet if they don't get down there. So he gets uh, he gets into the cockpit. He takes over the ship and, you know, the guy, the the one Mandalorian, he looks a little he looks a little worried for Axe because, you know, Axe is actually on the ship by himself. All the other Mandos are getting into their gauntlets, into their respectful positions, and they're going to go help Lady Bo. And it's just so interesting to see all of them fly out of the light cruiser and on to the gauntlets it was just such an incredible scene such a beautiful cinematic scene and you see the tie fighters and the tie interceptors they're all flying up towards the light cruiser they're blasting and firing and sparks are going everywhere we see axe is trying to hold down the fort while the rest of his fellow mandalorians are going to bo katan's aid and he definitely looks worried. He's he's definitely concerned if he's going to be able to survive this. Honestly, I thought Axe was going to die uh, watching this whole entire scene because I didn't know what was going to happen to him next. But he hops into the cockpit and the TIE fighters and TIE interceptors, they're all swarming around him. And you can clearly see the smoke and everything outside of the window. They're blowing up the ship bit by bit they are not holding anything back they are raining fire blaster on blaster and they almost actually hit the bridge where axe was sitting to control the ship and it was just crazy but we ended up cutting to a, a scene where did and grogu they're snooping around the whole entire uh base and they get to the corridor where all the other super elite commandos are and then tells Grogu to stay put that R5 is going to have to deactivate the ray shields 
in order for him to take out each and every commando that is standing guard so the ratios come down and we see Den go in at full force i mean he is busting these guys up he is taking them out one by one it's this literally reminds me a little bit of the phantom menace when qui-gon and obi-wan are separated and they're waiting on each other for the ratios to open up but Din is taking them out one by one he knocks one guy off of the off of the ledge and he couldn't grab the gun in time so he slides kicks one guy in the chest that guy gets knocked out and he is uh they're using their shock batons so he takes one from him and when he gets the shock baton and the shield then it's pretty much he's ready at this point he's ready to pretty much throw down take care of the rest of them and that's what he does and now these guys give him a little bit of run of run for his money because they're you know they they weren't really prepared but they were prepared and we see Den kind of just going at it we got r5 uh trying to hack into the system to get the other ratios down but you see the mouse droid is trying to get him caught and uh R5 actually this is a badass moment a little bit for R5 but he takes his his shocker or his stinger and he stuns the uh, the mouse droid and he finally gets the shield down and then busts through the ray shield and he's pretty much taken out all these other super elite commandos took him a minute but he definitely got it done uh, the mouse droids are still sitting around and they're trying to get R5 captured but R5 wasn't having it like let's be real here he was not having it he was not sticking around for it. Um, he pretty much got the hell out of Dodge. And Grogu and Din are finally making their way into Moff Gideon's cloning facility, which is his cloning lab. So the next scene gets a little bit crazy. We end up in Moff Gideon's uh, laboratory, his cloning facility. And Grogu and Din are walking through this lab and you see all the different clones that Gideon was going to use for his new phase for dark troopers and it's a very eerie moment because we know what cloning is in the Star Wars universe and we know what is coming out of the cloning project and we see all these clones in their tanks none of them are breathing none of them are active but then decides to deactivate the capsules and make them explode grogu is curious so he decides to go up to one of the tanks and as he's getting closer he is examining the clone and when he looks very close at the moff Gideon clone it actually startles grogu it uh it it opens its eyes uh so it's it's almost as if the consciousness is there and it's living and the clone of gideon is beginning to wake up so grogu is startled he's scared he runs back over to to den and den hits the detonation button to destroy all of the clones in their capsules den and grogu are basically running out of the uh out of the the laboratory because they don't want to be in there when that's getting exploded and all the water and everything is going everywhere so they leave we cut to another shot where Bo and the rest of the mandos are going to a refuge spot that the other three were surviving mandalorians uh found and as they go down through this cavern uh they realize that it's a lot greener it's a lot fresher it's a lot more lighting and Bo begins to realize that there's a lot of organic soil down here in this cavern and she stops and kind of just really takes a look around to embrace the moment and Kashka asks if the three survivors have been living there and they basically say they've been living there for a while and there's other places also on Mandalore that has these organic gardens that's from the actual surface of Mandalore it's just after the bombing um the plants and the gardens began to sprout again because not many people were on mandalore anymore the planet was basically uh inhabitant and no one lived there so the plants and the flowers and the crops began to 
sprout once again. And this gave hope to Bo and the rest of the other Mandalorians because this is an opportunity to have these gardens and to have these organic flower and plant life grow so Mandalore can prosper again. I thought it was a beautiful scene to see that just to show that life can still persist on Mandalore. We cut to another scene where uh, the TIE Interceptors and the Gauntlets are basically... Uh, coming out of orbit and it's just a badass moment because the armor basically calls Bo-Katan and say that the reinforcements is there everyone is happy and rejoiceful they put their helmets on and they are called to arms and the next scene that comes up is probably one of the most incredible badass scenes uh, I would say is it's the money shot of the entire episode and um, you see the gauntlets fly down you see the armor prepare to jump out this is this is just a cool part guys because the armor actually gets her jetpack and I think that's just awesome and you see all of the Mandalorians falling from the sky in their jetpacks like the cavalry and you just get this awesome moment where you see Bo and the armor and just the legion of Mandalorians behind them. And the coolest shot is made where Bo pulls out the Darksaber and she ignites it. And it's just so incredible. It felt like a moment straight from out of the Clone Wars. I just could not imagine how incredible that was. But it's just a beautiful shot. Absolutely beautiful shot. And you see them... Uh, take off in their jetpacks and they're heading down into Moff Gideon's base where they go to face him and defeat him So this too was also a real cool scene uh, just to see the Mandalorians all fly down into the base of Moss Moff Gideon and Just to see Bo flying with the Darksaber and then seeing the super elite commandos charging at the Mandalorians You got like good versus evil like the good old good versus evil conflict. I just thought the shot was really cool, especially when you get a first person point of view of them and their jetpacks flying towards the Super Elite Commandos. I thought it was just cool. Um, the armorer was like badass in this whole entire fight scene. She was like just damaging so many of the Super Elite Commandos that it was just cool and you get to see Bo with the dark saber as well and that also kind of was like a real cool thing because she was deflecting blaster bolts it kind of almost makes me wonder if she's a little bit force sensitive but then again she has had training with the dark saber for so long but the armorer was just so cool in that scene uh to see her take down uh, a couple of the super elite commandos and axe wolves he he was just pretty badass um then we go back to moff gideon and Din and Grogu, they finally made it to his, basically his throne room. And the doors are shutting behind them. And uh, they're trying to figure out where Moff Gideon is. And, you know, as he's coming out of hiding, you know, they, they, they pretty much find out that they're trapped at this point. They don't know where to go. But then they hear his voice. So they stood back and trying to stay clear of Gideon, knowing that he's right around the corner and you see him standing in his new phase dark trooper armor um he is giving his monologue about how he had these clones and how the clones were supposed to have the force because those clones were clones of him clones that were uh the midichlorian count were isolated throughout their bodies so he could harness the force why is he so obsessed with the force we don't know yet but a battle engages then tells Grogu to stay behind. Moff Gideon is uh, firing off missiles to try to harm Din, but it doesn't work, so he puts his helmet on. And he pretty much prepares for battle. Uh, Grogu stays in the clear and tries not to intervene in the fight and just let Din handle everything. But you can clearly see how strong Moff Gideon is in this new phase of Dark Trooper armor he is so strong that he actually throws Din like like it was nothing almost effortless effortless effortlessly <laughs> I can't talk today guys 
and um like he's actually punching the best car he's not putting a dent in the best car of course but he's so strong it it it's he, it then can literally feel how powerful how forceful he is with this brand new armor i mean it's not just regular armor it has cybernetics and all that stuff in it so then we get the Praetorian guards they show up and then is he's he's knowing he's pretty much in trouble and he doesn't know what to do so he's just he's just winging it these you know the guards are coming towards him and he's trying to hold his own while gideon is pretty much watching from a far standpoint and then holds his own for a little minute but again it's a numbers game you got three powerful warrior assassins who were trained in almost everything in every fighting style and even though Din uh, is a great bounty hunter, a great Mandalorian, an excellent fighter, these guys are just way too much to handle uh, by himself. So Grogu, little little Grogu, decides to uh, intervene and get the guards' attention, and they chase after him. And at this point, this distracts Din, and he is worried. And at this point, guys, I'm not going to lie. I thought something bad was going to happen to Grogu because we were all nervous. Like, is there going to be another death? Is Grogu going to die? Is Din going to die? Like, we did not know what to expect of this episode. So when I saw that the Praetorian guards were going to fight Grogu and take Grogu away, I was nervous. And I didn't know what to expect. And we see Din. Like, he's desperate. You know, he's he's trying to reach Grogu, but it's just far too late. It's just way far too late. And Moff Gideon is basically holding him, holding him down so he cannot reach Grogu at all. And we get these cool battle scenes. You know, the Mandalorians, they're still fighting. The armor is still kicking ass. She is hammering away at all of these super elite commandos man it is so cool to see her fight and kashka oh my gosh she was amazing with her jetpack again it feels like we were watching a, a episode of the clone wars it really feels like it's a live action version of clone wars in the siege of mandalore this was also another beautiful shot i just love that and how she just took out those guards but man um just an incredible scene then we get back to Grogu and he's fighting the Praetorian guards again and he's uh, they they took out IG-11's body so Grogu has no choice but to uh, come out of the vessel and try to defend for himself and we get to see him actually use some of his force abilities you know he's using force jump he's dodging around kind of like how Yoda fought uh, Count Dooku and I thought that was cool to see we see uh gideon in this awesome shot just using his flamethrower to kind of overwhelm din and uh these two are really throwing down like it's it's a pretty gruesome battle between din and moff gideon and right when din is thinking he's getting the upper hand gideon once again shows that his new suit and his new abilities in his suit is just too powerful for Din and Din alone. And um, he's doing everything that he, at, that he can <clears throat> to defend himself. But as you can tell, it's nothing that Din can do at this point. Um, so that's when Bo sees that Din needs help. And she comes in, she sticks the landing, she is waiting for um, Din to get up on his knees to make sure he was okay. She tells Din to go get Grogu because she will handle Moff Gideon you know she has the dark saber Moff Gideon was the one that pretty much took everything from her so she wants to end this battle herself she wants to be the one to end Moff Gideon so we get this awesome cool shot of Bo holding her dark saber and we see Gideon take out this interesting cool device that looks like a double bladed lightsaber but it's really like a you know, it's really like one of the weapons that the Praetorian guards use. And um, then we just cut to this awesome shot of Bo with the dark saber. And it's just so cool to see her wield it 
and then these two start going at it and fighting each other now you know i feel like the fight between gogu and the praetorian guards i wish it was a little bit longer and maybe if they could display a little bit more force abilities but i still thought this was a really cool scene to see grogu uh toss around a couple of the guards and to also see din display a little bit more of you know fighting tactics and you know his experience uh to see to see both gideon and Bo fight the different dynamics what they're fighting for what are they trying to uh accomplish from both sides of their characters i think i think this was a, a great fight um you see the strength of moff gideon but you also see the strength of bo -Katan. and she gets the call from uh i think axe wolves later on in the fight that he is on his way to drop the ship down into the base of moff gideon and you know grogu he's uh he's basically doing his own thing kind of kicking ass with these praetorian guards like they really can't stand a chance the last time i checked i believe the praetorian guards were trained in all aspects of fighting styles but um din really he held his own with grogu's help a little bit but it was just interesting to see that the praetorian guards get beaten i thought you know maybe they would have had to somehow escape or something like that just to get away from the praetorian guards but they didn't touch on that at all um axe wolves is of course in the light cruiser he's heading down bo -Katan is still fighting moff gideon and i gotta say this particular scene is what everybody is getting very upset about and there's a lot of controversy behind it but i honestly believe that this was the best thing to do uh with this fight and i don't think that this was a personally i don't think it was a, a great idea but it had to be done and um the dark saber being destroyed was something that i was not expecting to see i was devastated uh when i saw the dark saber got destroyed especially when you know den has said that it was made from a best card that he's never seen before um i just thought that maybe this thing was almost indestructible but apparently it is and moff gideon's crushing you know the dark saber best guard versus best guard i guess i can understand that i see now why it was um why it was basically destroyed i just wish they didn't destroy it the way they did in this episode but i'm quite sure it would be some significance to it later um just when we think that bo -Katan is being defeated you know moff gideon is going through his monologue like any other villain ever does in any other episode and um as soon as she thinks that she is about to be killed by Gideon, Din shows up and he saves bo -Katan. And we also get uh, help from Grogu as well because he's there helping uh, helping Din and, and Bo fight off Moff Gideon. Now the light cruiser, Moff Gideon's uh, old ship is basically falling down into the entire base of mandalore and axe wolves is inside he realizes he's getting way too close so he exits through the bridge he blasts uh, an opening and he escapes and you see the whole entire ship comes crashing down through the opening crevice of the of the base and Bo is giving everything that she has. I gotta, I gotta give a round of applause for Katie Sackhoff for playing this role because man, she plays Bo Katan so so well live action. And just to see the intensity of all four of these characters here fighting was amazing, just absolutely amazing. And uh, as the ship comes comes crashing down, the fire comes up and it just burns Moff Gideon to death so we think there's a theory behind that still if 
which we will dis- we'll discuss that later on in another episode. But uh, Moff Gideon is apparently killed in this fire, and the whole entire base is being blown to bits. And I thought this was an incredible callback to Kane and Jars. And I'm not gonna lie, I caught tears seeing this because this was almost the exact same scene that we got in Rebels when Kanan Jars was trying to help Hera and Sabine and Ezra escape on that planet. And man, this was this shows you how powerful Grogu is. If Kanan couldn't hold back flames like that and he struggled with it, and Grogu is doing this almost with ease, uh, of course he is getting tired, but the fact that he was able to accomplish this shows how strong Grogu is, Grogu is and he saved Bo and Din from that fierce fire. And um, as you can tell, he's a little bit tired. But in the end, they defeated Moff Gideon. We come to a real cool shot of the city of Sanuri, uh, Mandalore. And it's just a gorgeous shot. I'm glad that they decided to go with that particular angle. It looks amazing um, and we're back into the mines of Mandalore where the armorer is performing the baptism for Ragnar Vizsla because as we know Paz Vizsla is killed and Ragnar his son is the only one left so Ragnar is um, resuming his baptism since it was interrupted by that big huge Jurassic Park monster that we saw and <laughs> we are now seeing him perform his baptism and becoming a full-fledged Mandalorian. Uh, Din shows up with Grogu, and as he watches, uh, he realizes that this would be a perfect opportunity for Grogu to take on the Creed. So Ragnar is baptized. The armor basically uh, takes the living waters and pours it over his helmet. And this is the way. So he is now a Mandalorian. And Din is bringing in Grogu as everyone acknowledges him, including Bo Katan. And uh, considering she is the ruler of Mandalore right now. The armorer still seems like she holds a very significant role over the Mandalorians, so I'm really curious to see how all of this plays out later on in the future. But Din wishes for Grogu to take the Creed, but he cannot take the Creed because he can't talk. So Din asks the armorer if it's possible that if his parents could allow him to vouch to become a Mandalorian, and she said his family is somewhere out there, maybe possibly dead, and they just don't know what to really do at that point as far as him being a Mandalorian. So Din and the rest of the Mandalorians, Axe Wolves, Kashka, and uh, Bo-Katan agree that Din should be adopted into the Mandalorian culture. So Din takes on the responsibility of adopting young Grogu and Grogu will become a Mandalorian and he is now his father we also get this cool shot where Grogu is looking into the living waters which I was very excited for because this is the opportunity guys that we've been waiting for this is one of the moments we've been waiting for to see Grogu interact with the legendary Mythosaur and I love the way the camera angles takes everything down into the living waters and we circle through all the cracks and crevices and the caverns underneath and we get this incredible shot of the mythosaur sleeping in slumber as it awakes hearing Grogu's call how awesome is that this next scene was actually a really cool scene it was kind of cool to see the mythosaur banner uh, back up again and being hung from the Great Forge and just around Mandalore in general. We get the armorer where she is standing amongst the masses of the Mandalorians that are left, the survivors. 
and it's pretty cool to see the armor pass over the torch to Bo-Katan as she takes on her leadership as ruler over Mandalore once again and uh, she takes the torch and she ignites the great forge you see the fire turn from a fiery red to a piercing blue and it's just a kind of like a callback to one of the very first episodes in the Mandalorian where the armor is forging his um, forging his his armor you see the rest of the the Mandalorians they're clanging their best guard together um, in the honor and spirit of Mandalore and we hear them chant for Mandalore uh, especially axe wolves leading the pack of the mess the rest of the Mandalorians on the planet it's just such a beautiful scene and it's definitely unforgettable definitely got Game of Thrones vibes from it though but it was just an absolutely beautiful scene and I could watch that scene all over again uh, and not get tired of it uh, we see Din uh, making his way back to Navarro planet Navarro Din is going back to Navarro and he has some I guess some business there with of course uh, Grief Karga um, but before we go back to Navarro he is going to the Adelphi base and he's going to talk to Captain Carson Tiva uh, which is the the Captain General of basically the Rebel the Rebel Alliance and he enters the bar and this is a cool scene because we see Dave Filoni and Deborah Child sitting in the background making their cameos which was like just so cool it looks like he's wearing Cat Bane's hat uh, instead of his signature cowboy hat uh, maybe it was some Easter egg that Dave Filoni decided to throw in there but that hat looks very very similar to Cat Bane's hat so maybe he took Cat Bane's hat or maybe it's something from something else who knows the one thing I love about this scene is the fact that we are setting up everything for season four and um, Grogu sits down at the bar and he realizes that there is a IG-11 head sitting up at the top and Din and Captain Carson Tiva are talking about bounties and that Grogu is now his apprentice and his adopted son and he basically wants to be very selective on certain bounties and missions that he goes on for the safety of himself and Grogu and Carson Tiva is he's a man that goes by the book and he doesn't believe that the New Republic would do this but Din is insinuating that Captain Carson Tiva will do this under the table and he agrees he thinks about it for a little bit but he definitely agrees and then wants to be a little bit off the radar he wants to be much more safe he tells captain carson tiva that it's a good idea and he's already accepted the offer and he realizes that he wants ig-11's head because his head has um the memory bank and the memory circuit that he needs to uh rebuild ig-11 back on the borrow grief Karga, the good man that he is he uh meets up with Din back on Navarro and he gives Din the deed to a nice cabin that's on the outside or the outskirts of the planet where Din can be at peace where Grogu can be at peace where they can live together father and son and a place where they can go on um, missions on the low without anybody really being able to bother them and I think this is great um, and just out of good faith Din gives grief a nice present which is ig-11 he is back as the marshal now for navarro and he will be protecting the citizens and making sure that navarro is safe and this is what grief Karga has been looking for for a while he's been looking for a marshal he's been looking for someone and you know din knows he's not that guy he he knows that he cannot do that right now he has other obligations and other duties and he believes that ig-11 would be a better suit and that's what we get so we go over to din's and uh grogu's cabin and they are living peacefully and i thought this was the best ending you know this is what din needed he needed some peace and quiet and we finally got that and this sets up uh 
for season four and hopefully we'll get some more cool mando stuff and Din and grogu doing some bounties so if y'all guys enjoyed this video man make sure you like comment subscribe make sure you hit the notifications bell that way you know when i upload my videos to youtube i know this was a very long video this was almost like an hour long but this was the season finale that was worth being covered so if you enjoyed what you what you saw hit that subscribe button hit that like button notifications bell and that way y'all guys will know when i upload my videos to youtube and i will catch y'all guys on the flip side this is the way may the force be with you i'm totally looking forward to season four can't wait to see what dave and john favreau have in store